Let's take a second or 20 minutes to look at the most legendary bad bots in Transformers history and a few of their darkest deeds. And no, Unicron is not at the top of this list because he's not a Decepticon. Disqualify. There are quite a few of these to get through, so grab a beverage, like the video, get subscribed if you aren't already because it really does mean a lot to a little channel like mine, and of course get in the comments to let me know which you think are the most powerful Decepticreeps. Right, let's get real, and let's start with Predator King. So what happens when five or six volatile, aggressive maniacs all fuse together into one body? Well, you get one super powerful killing machine that's usually that's usually either stupid or all out crazy because of all of the minds clashing in one body. No idea what that must be like. But Predator King manages to unite all of these personalities through a common love of the hunt. He's made up of Razor Claw, Dive Bomb, Rampage, Headstrong, and Tantrum, and is one of the most powerful Decepticons ever unleashed onto the field of battle. In Power of the Primes, he wiped the floor with Volcanicus, which is weird because you would have thought that the combined form of the Dinobots would be super powerful. No, I fell down. In Power of the Primes, though, it took the power of Megatronus to eventually bring him down. Megatronus just popping his head off here. Casual, Casual decapitation. decapitation! Another incarnation was in Beast Hunters, where he bested Prime in battle before being beaten by Megatron, but only because he was under the control of the spirit of Unicron, and even helped the Autobots slow down a horde of undead Predacons in Beast Hunters the movie just long enough to allow Prime to defeat Unicron. He was a stand-up guy, this guy. So Predator King, only combiner that can streamline its personalities, beat Volcanicus, held back an army of the dead, can only be taken down by literal gods. All hail, Predator King. All right, moving on. Now often, the Achilles heels of any of these big bots is often they're kind of dumb. Fortress Maximus, prepare for your death today. You're gonna die. Not in the case of Scorponok. Crushing claws, electric stinger in the tail, cool shades. But also, big smorts. Sometimes. Scorponok is built for brute force tactics, but he's not exactly stupid either, sometimes being portrayed as a scientist or engineer even, and he's sometimes even in contention for leadership of the Decepticons. He believes that the strong should rule unchallenged and the weak should be culled. At one point in the IDW comics, after Megatron lost the battle to Optimus, Scorponok banished his former leader to a junk planet, took control of the Decepticons, and set about breaking up Optimus's grand convocation, which is kind of like a democratic government of bots that were neither Autobot or Decepticon. Earthrise put a weird spin on things with this character, where we find out that the Quintessence created numerous Scorponoks. By the sounds of it, they had their own homeworld. They weren't from Cybertron, and only one managed to survive aboard a space station jammed halfway in and halfway out of a space bridge. This one bears a Decepticon symbol, but for some reason Megatron doesn't recognize him. So I don't really know what's going on there. But I do prefer this because at least it's opening up more lore to whatever is going on in Bayformers. Like, look, you know, I don't hate this version of Scorponok. I just thought that he didn't do this character any justice whatsoever. One of his darkest deeds involved torturing poor Grimlock until he gave up an artifact called the Magnificence, before dumping his broken body in a stasis pod on a World Sweeper class starship, basically the equivalent of wrapping the body up in an old rug and throwing it in a garbage truck, before using the knowledge from the Magnificence to try and implant a Cybertronian spark into an organic body. Why you would want to do that? I'm not entirely sure. Surely it's better to be a robust, durable steel life form that can literally live for millions of years rather than a squishy and fragile Humi? I, I don't know. Maybe there are certain things that organic bodies can feel that robot bodies can't. You know what I mean? You see what I'm saying? Not to bring the smut, but you know. In one particularly universe-ending plotline, he was loosely involved in the creation of a god gun to drill a hole into the next universe. But that's a story that I'm going to keep for a Transformers most ludicrous weapons vid, so make sure you subscribe for that. Next up, Deathsaurus, leader of the Breast Force? For strange fondness for children? No, really? Appearing in the Japanese Transformers Victory, Deathsaurus was the leader of the Decepticons, leading a faction called the Breast Force. And yeah, honestly, I was going to do jokes about this, but it, you know, it's just too obvious. I mean, anyway, he would transform into a fearsome pterodactyl type dragon beast, and his goal was to get his planet harvesting fortress up and running by stealing Earth's energy. He was so powerful that he would only get out of bed to fight the strongest of Autobots, mainly his rival, Star Saber. He had a whippy chain, he had a cannon called a living metal destroying 
canon. I'll be honest, I haven't seen this Japanese show, but it sounds absolutely awesome. In the IDW line, he was a more compassionate general, compassionate towards his own troops anyway, and he hated the way that Megatron treated his subordinates. Then later, when Megatron joined the Autobots, he joined the Decepticon Justice Division before leaving to hunt down Megatron by himself. In Transformers Galaxies, he was a diplomat. Well, well, only in the way that a Decepticon could be a diplomat. He would travel to planets to torment and torture the native populations for his own sado shits and giggles. But the form that really earns him a place on this list is in Transformers War's End, where he's possessed by an entity called Exarchon. Now, Exarchon was a Cybertronian who became a sort of a biological virus. He was able to take over and control three other bots' bodies at once. His main Main goal being to possess and snuff out as many Cybertronian sparks as possible. This terrifying entity would probably be on the list himself, save for the fact that he is not a Decepticon. Dis 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 as he originates from before the Cybertronian Civil War and ended up being as big a threat to the Decepticons as he was to the Autobots. But back to Deathsaurus, a few examples of his evil deeds were flaming this guy for not handing over all of his energon, which he probably needed. He torments entire civilizations, leaving just enough of them alive so that they can rebuild their society so that he can return and do it all over again. And oh yeah, under the influence of Exarchon, he tried to wipe out Cybertron by attempting to take control of and snuffing out the Allspark itself. Now shit is really getting real. So you know how most Decepticons are just like Kill Autobot. Well this guy wasn't one of those. He was one of the few that actually seemed to care about Cybertron itself but when he tried to warn both Decepticons and Autobots about how this war was ripping apart the planet, no one really listened. La 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 la. So what did he do? Complain to the boss? Start a petition? No! He underwent a procedure called polydermal grafting. What? Mm-hmm. Polydermal grafting. A procedure that even Megatron thought was weird and unnatural. It involved taking bits of living Living organic tissue to create, and I quote, an armored symbiotic carapace. Weird and unnatural. That made him pretty much invincible. This guy's name is Thunderwing, by the way. I just realized I completely forgot to mention his name. Atomic breath. <laughs> and not even the combined firepower of the Autobots and Decepticons could take him down. But the process also sent him mad as a hatter, and he ended up trying to kill everyone and everything before the planet itself swallowed him whole. Oh, the irony. He actually had an even more devastating form that they referred to as Ultra Mode that he kind of evolved into when he was later revived by a Decepticon called Bludgeon. Bludgeon used this mysterious form of Energon called Ultra Energon that gave us this hideous monstrosity. Let's talk about Tarn. Shapeshifter, classical music lover, leader of the Decepticon Justice Division. This guy can literally talk you to death. So a bot that fashioned and wears the Decepticon insignia as a mask, as his own face, is bound to have some issues, right? Transforming into a crazy battle tank. This guy might not be as overpowered as some of the uber villains on this list, but he more than makes up for it in terms of influence. And he has that influence because in terms of cruelty, this guy is off the chart. He put this guy's brain in his mouth. Oh my god, what a nightmare! Before the war, this guy was known as Darmus. Darmus realized that he had an ability to switch off non-sentient machinery with just his voice, before somehow falling foul of the Senate and being subjected to Emperata, a punishment that symbolizes stripping away any individuality from a bot. As time went on, his special ability evolved, to the point he could kill even sentient bots with just his voice. Lou, 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 you dead now. Ah! He became the superintendent of Grindcore Prison, quite often torturing and even melting down prisoners. And all this was before he became leader of the DJD, which is basically like the Decepticons SS, where he would mercilessly hunt down anyone on his hit list before brutally murdering them. Notable names who got taken down by this guy include Ultra Magnus, Cyclonus, and the next name on my list, Overlord. Turns out that way back when, in the days when Megatron was still a gladiator, Megatron was the one and only bot able to vanquish this guy. Megatron, seeing that this guy was one of the few that was in the same league as him, sparred regularly with him to keep his skills sharp. But this weird dynamic developed between the two where Overlord developed kind of a, like a phobia of losing and a kind of obsession with beating Megatron. Kind of like a losing beating obsession phobia. 
phobia. I'm good. No, wait, I'm confused. Once the Civil War broke out, he joined the Decepticons. But he's one of those bots that doesn't care about the politics of the whole thing. He just, he just wanted to see the violence and the carnage of the gladiator fights play out on a wider and even more brutal stage. What is it he's doing in this still? <laughs> hey, Ronnie, where you been? Behold, my invisible guinea pigs. They were this big and I got right in there. I was like... <laughs> And then, Megatron ordered that he get an upgrade and basically made invincible by fusing his skeleton with an element called Anontrium and putting him at the head of a faction called the Warriors Elite before eventually, and I'm shortening a long story here, coming to a disagreement with Megatron and declaring himself free of Megatron's rule. Oh, and if you think he did this to join the light side, no! he did this shortly after massacring all of the Wreckers bar cup. In hell, cut man. So this left him technically a deserter to be hunted by the DJD. And yes, that brings us back to Tarn, who ended up chainsawing his head off in IDW's More Than Meets the Eye. So to recap, second only to Megatron in combat, massacred the Wreckers, turned a prison into a gladiatorial hell pit where he forced bots to fight each other, like this Autobot had to rip another Autobot's head off, only to find that their prize for winning wasn't freedom, but the choice of either facing Overlord in combat or committing suicide up. Let's talk about Nemesis Prime. At first I wondered if this guy should actually be on this list because, you know, is he actually a Decepticon or just a dark version of Prime? Disqualified. No, no, wait. But then I saw so much artwork out there with the Decepticon logo, Decepticon logo, Decepticon logo, so, you know, I'm rolling with it. The first bot to bear the name Nemesis Prime came in Armada, even though there were versions that came before, like Scourge, that was pretty much the same character. In Armada, he was a mindless, vicious shapeshifter that had a dark version of the Star Saber. And in War for Cybertron Kingdom, you really got a good feeling of his combat skill. <laughs> But the one that nearly destroyed the whole of Cybertron was in the Transformers Cybertron comic where Unicron had cloned him to destroy Primus and therefore Cybertron with the dark energy contained within a dead matrix. If he had succeeded, this would have allowed the dark energy and Unicron himself to take over our universe as well. As I said in my most powerful Autobots vid, if, if you consider that with the power of the Matrix, Optimus is one of the most powerful Autobots, then you have to apply the same logic to this guy. Bayformers took the whole mirror thing and went, ah, no, you know what, that's too complicated. Let's just turn Optimus evil. That's simpler. Stupid audience will understand that. And although it wasn't an approach that I particularly like, it did show us how terrifying an evil Optimus would be. Like he ripped Bumblebee's doors off. There was another version of Nemesis, again in IDW's continuity, where Nova Prime, one of the primes before Optimus, gets stuck in the dead universe, and he's altered by the darkness, a malevolent entity which is the dark mirror of the Matrix of Creation, or as we're more used to calling it, the Matrix of Leadership. This thing is anti-life itself, and through its new vessel, Nemesis, it intended to spread death and darkness through the entirety of our universe. The only reason it didn't was that the living darkness wanted to transfer to Optimus, and so Nemesis never used the full power of the darkness against him. And long story short, he was double-crossed by Galvatron, who wanted it for himself. Ruthless, fearsome, sometimes a little overconfident, we couldn't have a list like this without perhaps the most pivotal figure in Cybertronian history. Without this guy, there's no civil war that costs millions of lives and lasts thousands of years. Now, needless to say that there have been a plethora of incarnations of this guy, but which are the most powerful? Well, there's a bunch to pick from here for sure, but the one I wanted to highlight was uh, Unitron? Megacron. Megacorn, Megacron. I don't know, this guy. Well, you know how I started this vid by saying that there was no place for Unicron here? Well, let's bend that rule just a little. Because in Prime, Megatron was already a beast. I really like this incarnation. But when he was taken over by the spirit of Unicron, he went to a whole new level of genocidal rage. He corrupted Cybertron with Dark Energon and tried to raise an army of the dead to engulf the living. Bayformer's Megatron was a force to be reckoned with plucking Jazz in half before being usurped in pretty much every sequel by a more powerful bad guy. He also killed Michael Bay. Disgusting. Yeah, that was Michael Bay apparently. Next up would be Galvatron. So we all know the story here, right? I don't need to dwell on it, but in short, he's an upgraded version of Megatron, so probably physically stronger, and with a few screws loose from being dipped in this crazy juice from a plasma bar. Who disturbs my plasma bath? Uh, yeah, but Galvatron, there's a huge civil war happening, the Autobots are attacking, they've just taken out one of our bases. Plasma bath! 
Ah! Defeat at the hands of Rodimus Prime really seemed to send this guy over the edge and gave him an unhinged ruthless streak like Megatron never had, often beating and chastising his own troops. <laughs> It's that unhinged mad dog factor, combined with his obvious physical and weaponry enhancements, that makes me put him so high on the list. Like here, he turns around and destroys this planetoid with a single shot for absolutely no reason. <laughs> Next on the list, and we're really getting to the upper echelons now, I've put Trypticon. Colossal, monument stealing, Prone to getting possessed by the spirit of Starscream, this guy is one of the only Decepticon Titans, although Scorponok is sometimes considered a Titan, sometimes not. I've spoken about him in other videos, so I won't go into too much detail here, but, but just suffice to say that although this guy is definitely one of the most physically imposing, he's not always the most evil. In one IDW comic, he kind of hated himself for what he was, so he went in search of a new peaceful life to find happiness. No! And he even once died while trying to defend Earth from Unicron. None of that takes away from the raw power of this guy though, I mean, just look at him. And so here we are, and phew, this has been a long video. But without further ado, I've chalked up the most powerful Decepticon ever as Megatronus. I know that in some continuities Megatronus is just another name for Megatron, but I'm talking about a guy occasionally known as the Fallen, who sat at the table of Primes and Judas the shit out of the place, becoming the very first Decepticon. As he and his brothers were the very first creations of the Allspark, or in other continuities by Primus, they have abilities beyond anything ever discovered before. He has a mystic command of what's referred to as entropic arts, entropy essentially being nature's way of everything decaying over time. And it's said that when he is at full strength, he can make uncreation at his focused will. He is an embodiment of the elemental forces of chaos, which may or may not be the same elements that gave rise to Unicron, or be Unicron, in fact. Another thing that I think makes him the most powerful is that, like his brothers the Primes, they are multi-dimensional entities, meaning that unlike anything else in the universe that has a doppelganger mirror version of themselves in each dimension, there is only one version of them, and they can travel from dimension to dimension at will, creating space bridges as and when he feels like. When he's at full power, of course. Now, personally, I wasn't a fan of Revenge of the Fallen's incarnation of this character. To me, he was a little bit too close to... But if you think about what he is, what he represents, you cannot deny that while there might be more powerful entities in the Transformers universe, this dude's actions created not only the Cybertronian Civil War, but the fundamental split between the notions of good and evil for millennia. He was the catalyst for the eternal struggle between order and chaos, between existence and nothingness. All right, guys, let's leave that there. If you've made it this far into the video, you've made it further than I thought anyone ever would. So I thank you for taking the time to watch my stuff. Stay tuned to the channel. Up next, I'm going to be looking at the alternate modes of the Rise of the Beast characters, and I'm going to be looking into RC's backstory across the continuities. Tell it to someone who cares. Hmm. And maybe I'll do a video on the primes. Those are videos that will probably take me a little while though, so in the meantime I'm going to be looking at the strangest Transformers designs, as well as the most ludicrous Transformers weapons. Loads of good stuff. So until then, let me invite you to get out of my head, and I will see you very soon for the next one. Thank you very much for watching, and cheerio bye!